I'm Kent Lund. Welcome to The Collectors. My next guest is going to talk about more wrinkle removers than you can imagine. Next on The Collectors. Jim Castle, I'm so happy to have you allow us in to well, see your collection and your, your lovely you. wife. We're going to talk about wrinkle removers, as in irons, That's ironing it. clothing. Antique irons. So most of the people in the audience will recognize a simple iron that might have been around the house when they were growing up that's used as a doorstop or for decoration. That right? would be this. Okay. And who makes this? And or who made that? Everybody made them. Every, every little foundry made irons. It was such a common household item that uh, any, any foundry would have made them. The handle is usually made of wrought iron and it's cast to a cast iron base. That's called a flat iron or a sad iron. And sad is an old obsolete English term for heavy. And uh, I'm sad, okay. I that's, got it. Yeah, it's not uh, the way you feel on laundry day. <laughs> that's not where it comes right, from. Right, right. Okay, but that's the classic iron sure. that everybody remembers. The French, French always do things a little bit differently. Had a whole way, a uh, different way of looking at irons. You notice this one's thinner. It's also hollow. And <laughs> what their idea was was uh, probably that it would heat up quicker. But the rest of the pressing iron world knows that a hot, heavy iron is going to last a lot okay, longer. Okay. Okay. There is a wives' tale, I believe, that they would fill this with alcohol and burn it to heat the iron. But wouldn't that heat oh, the handle? That's exactly what it would do. It would heat the handle intensively. <laughs> it would hardly crazy do French. anything to the base. Yeah. So I think their idea must have been that it would heat up quicker. I see. I see. So and then and then once it was hot, they might set it on something like this yeah, while these, in between. These are called trivets. Right. And sometimes quite fancy. This is an interesting one. It has uh, a lot of trades symbols. I think this is the Odd Fellow symbol. You got the blacksmith's equipment, the mason's equipment. Uh, blacksmith tongs for handle. Oh, this yeah. one here, more the ladies type, fancy floral design, but most of them are quite standard, quite uh, quite simple designs, a lot of more advertisers. This one's quite interesting. I don't I don't know what this one, how this one yeah. works. Well, this one, this is kind of my favorite here called a Metafuel. Metafuel was a, a company who developed a dry fuel to heat the iron if you were traveling. You would take this iron with you Set it upside down. You put your little stick of metal fuel in this cup, light it, and it would heat the iron. Unlike the French alcohol idea, it yeah. actually heated the bottom of the iron, yeah, not the top. That's pretty smart. Okay. When that fuel burned out, you were hot, and you could go ahead and do your ironing. Imagine getting ready yeah. to go on your sales calls a hundred <laughs> yeah. years ago, yeah. and you had to iron your yeah, shirt. You, you, you know, couldn't put so it on the wall. Uh, here's an odd one. A well, unique this one. one here is a billiard table iron, and oh, it's a lot heavier. I never than even it knew looks. they did that. Yeah, yeah, for ironing the felt. Now I don't know for sure whether you could dampen it and shrink it by oh, using that. that might be okay. Which might have been the case. Okay. Never having ironed a billiard table, I'm not sure. <laughs> this one here, as you got into the gaslight era, you could hook up to your chandelier. You'd run a tube from your chandelier down to the iron. If you open it up, and you have a tube with holes in the bottom that just direct the flame toward the sole of the iron. Just like a barbecue today. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. And this one, you put it together right, locks up. Okay. This one here is a, an old Belgian, what they call a round back box or slug iron. You put a hot iron slug in the back of it. And that would heat the iron. When that cooled off, you tipped it upside down, dumped it out, put another one in, and you would have a half a dozen slug heating, and you just go from one to the other. By the time you're done with number six, number one is hot again. So that you, <clears throat> you this iron slug is a chunk of iron that's heated just, just in a fire. A chunk of iron. I can show you here. This is another box iron, a little fancier. And oh, that's, okay. That's your slug. slug okay. You have several. That's of these also that a came casting. With the iron, right? Okay. And those would simply be put in. <clears throat> a little hard to do one-handed. <laughs> and that would heat the iron. This, uh, by the way, is a little fancier iron. This one's beautiful. 
punch decorated, and it has the initials of the owner and 1847. 1847. Mm -hmm. We got some old stuff here. This is another type of fuel iron. This took a liquid fuel in a little tank here. And uh, this one is almost a child's iron size. Child's irons when, like, like this were used by children to learn to iron at about age eight. I was just going to ask that question. When was it considered time to let a child handle at a about heat? Eight. About I'm eight. I'm sure the old. mother would determine uh, when she wanted to teach Help. the child how much fun it was to iron. <laughs> you had to do that at an early age. Yeah. Otherwise, they might figure it out. So this iron, not only used by children, but sometimes used on delicate things. Okay. And in case you had to get into a tight place, you'd use something like a sleeve iron. You might use a child's iron. In the case of these little white caps that women used to wear, they had irons <laughs> specially made for caps. It's called a cap iron. This is a fancy one. Most of them were quite simple. When you say cap, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, the, little, the little hats they wore, okay, little white little hat. gathered hats. Okay. Yeah. And I know we've got something here for hats, too. Uh, we'll right. get to that well, eventually. Well, there's a lot of hat irons. This we'll, is another we'll hat iron. It's called a brim iron. You can see the shape of that. And this would be used to go okay. around sure. doing the brim of the that hat. Makes sense. And we'll put that back. They did tend to get a little fancy once in a while. The swan is a nice example. They come in different sizes. You see a lot of little miniatures. It, kids evidently like them as toys, so okay. they cast a lot of uh, small swan irons. But that was a usable one. That's a smaller size. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay, we're going to grab well, this that. This one here is interesting. This is a, a typical removable handle iron. You'd have half a dozen of these and a handle. I think they actually came in sets of three or five, like the set we have here. Okay. All right, and they had different weights and sometimes different shapes. Yeah, here's a little different. If you had a set of five, you probably had a sleeve iron with it. Okay. In this case, you've got a, a button slot, and you can actually slide that underneath the button, go around. If you're that fanatic and you got to get that close to the button, that was another option. It's probably a good idea. They're not they, in this era. They weren't making plastic buttons because that would have melted them. <laughs> right. They were might bone. Been, they were bone or, or shell or yeah or metal. Yep. Here's here's another patentable idea. Whether it was any good or not, to get okay. a patent, you didn't need a good idea. You needed a unique idea. Yeah, that's right. That's you right. were you were welcome to have eight years of trouble-free manufacturing time without any competition on the worst idea in the world if you wanted it. <laughs> Okay. Is, that, is that soapstone? So whether this actually worked or not, I don't know. I've seen a lot of uh, heaters for your feet made out of soapstone. Okay. Now evidently soapstone held heat for a long time. But that might not be a good thing. If it didn't deliver heat, it weren't going to do any good with it. Okay. It might be hot for an hour and you still couldn't iron with it. But these are soapstone irons. One company had a patent on that. They made different sizes and styles. This was called a polishing iron. It's a small iron rounded edges used on linen primarily but this body of it is soapstone the bottom is iron and the handle is iron now just so i understand the process to a certain extent what you're ironing is better if it's damp when you're ironing it or, or it makes no uh, difference I'm, I'm not an ironer myself okay. but they did make sprinklers yep I that, that were commonly used to dampen the cloth before okay. you iron all right so evidently it helped now this is really an interesting Well, this is an unit. Austrian iron. A lot of these irons are, are foreign, and like the French, <laughs> they have they their own ideas. That's right. And, uh, they have a different one, word for everything, though, This French. one's quite unique. For one thing, uh, the flame comes out of the trivet, goes into the back of the iron, <laughs> and as it sits here, the flame comes out the top. That's the exhaust. Heats the iron, right. Hence the fire-breathing dragon motif. Oh, beautifully okay. designed. I mean, a nice, nice casting. Nice dragon with flame coming out of his mouth. This is quite heavy, by the way. And this is the trivet for it. You hooked your gas up to your chandelier. You adjusted your flame with the damper. Flame came out of here. And uh, anytime you set it on the trivet, you're getting heat. And it is a heavy iron. 
Let me cover that. This is a, a unique iron here. This is another odd patented idea. This has a handle, which when unhooked, flips out of the way. You could set it on your stove upside down. Then you didn't pick anything up off the stove. Why should your stove be dirty? Why your stove would be dirty, I don't know, but like what? I say, patentable idea. <laughs> Nobody copied it after that, so, so I'm who assuming there wasn't any real was advantage then. to it. Right. You flip it around, stick it back in, Ready to go. Then you're ready to go. This one. I was going to say, what is that one? That's like pretty a unique. common sad iron. This happens to have a, apparently a wrought iron base because it's forge welded. The, the wrought iron handle is forge welded to it. You couldn't do that with iron. So it's a heavy wrought iron base with a hand forged handle. The handle's been flattened in the middle and rolled and closed around a little metal. I don't know, a little chunk of metal or a pebble. And the idea, <laughs> this is this is another, another alcohol heated idea. The idea was that it was a slave iron. The slaves would have to would be making noise while they're ironing. Oh well, my that isn't God. gonna happen ever. One thing you're holding on to the handle, so you're dampening you're, any sound you might right. get out of it, and you're not ironing fast enough to move it. But it's a novelty. Got it, sure. You me. can actually hear it when you shake it. That was that was not real uncommon. I'll be darned. Hence the name slave iron. What do you what do we got here? Well, here we got the oldest type of iron that we know of. Oh. Chinese uh, were using irons in the uh, well the eighth century, 1700s, and they were using irons for silk. Now this oh. is a silk iron. It's a pan iron. It's what they call it. it. Has very fancy casting. I don't know whether you can see that on there. And it has a bone carved little man here. This is probably the fanciest iron. And now, that now, was, now that silk, was does, does that require a lower temperature to iron, I wonder? I don't know. I don't It's okay. a good question because this is another silk iron here. And this one here is used for making three dimensional flowers and leaves that you could sew onto a garment. And what they would do is they would take this and heat oh, it. Oh, so you're brass, reshaping the material. Lay the material on it. Okay. You have a mated piece. Probably the bronze is cast when they have this made. Okay. Then you've got a real close duplicate. You lay your silk in there. You put this in, and it takes a permanent set at the oh, right heat. Oh, right. Okay. okay. Something you wouldn't want to happen with this one. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, that made three-dimensional, in this case, leaves. Interesting iron. Wow, leaves. Inter yeah, that's interesting. Now, we were talking about having several irons and one handle. That's what we have here. This is a set that was this sold is a set, just yeah. this way. A woman named Mrs. Potts came up with the, what, the patentable, or the real bragging feature wasn't the multiple heads. That was fairly common. Here's an old one that has a real primitive setup. Okay. Still had several irons and one handle. One handle, sure. Okay, that was not really the patentable feature here. The interesting part about this was the advertised wooden cold handle. Mrs. Potts' cold handle iron was the big thing. And the kit came with a trivet, came with a handle, came with three or five different irons. Okay. And the handle, of course, would be removed. And is that, for doing, is that for doing small work this or is, is that a, a child set? Okay. Now, this would be a child okay. set, not that the mother might not use it for, for small stuff, yep. In for touch ups. Work. And another thing here that we didn't mention, I found this when we bought the kit. And it's a waxer. Oh, this has okay. wax in it and a little porous cloth bag and you would wax the iron. It made it glide easier. It also acted as an anti-rust. Oh, sure, uh, on, on, the, on the raw metal. Right. It's raw steel right. or raw so iron. Once the iron was hot, you could apply that wax. There was also wax sold in cakes in different forms for the same purpose. I'd, I'd like to talk about this for a second because mm -hmm. it, that this one fascinated me. This is the uh, ribbon. Call it, call it gophering iron or a gophering iron, gophering depending iron. how you pronounce it. It has a heating element just like the slug iron had. Okay. You'd heat that up 
slide it in. That gives you a warm. controlled warm heat okay. without being too outrageously hot and without being dirty from the stove. These were used originally for doing these big round Elizabethan collars that had the ribbon candy sort of a fold Oh yeah, tool. sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's what they did on these. They also found it was good for salvaging ribbon. Wrapping if ribbon. If you had wrapping Ribbons. ribbon, it was nice silk ribbon. It's been tied in a bow. It looks like... All wrinkled. Yeah, yeah. right. You could use that. Just straighten it right back out. Right, right, salvage right over there. ribbon. All right. And they came in a number of sizes. And sometimes there would be 90 degrees, there'd be two of them, one facing this way and one perpendicular to it above. A smaller size, sometimes okay. as many as three. And quite elaborate on some of those. I mean, speaking about elaborate, this one here is another charcoal iron, like the Chinese pan iron. Only now, the charcoal goes inside. It has a damper on it that can be adjusted to it to control the burn to control the burn and you've got this wonderful dragon's head on there yeah that's something else yeah these, these are these are quite nice i like that we just got that this year and this one here is a rather massive thing with a big I thought it was for weightlifting. Yeah, with this it handle. looks like. Uh, well, it is a weightlifting. <laughs> yes, it is. You, the, the, the people who use this yeah, had well, strong this was arms. Back in the days when men were men and so were women. <laughs> but your charcoal goes in here, closed up. And this is from India. For some reason, India seems to have a corner on the brass market. They make everything out yep. of brass. Everybody else makes out like brass is gold, not the Indians. And. Uh, this would have been used by a tailor or commercial laundry. Okay. okay. Not the kind of thing you'd fire up for a little bit of home laundry. Got it. Okay. Really, that's really something. Now we've got uh, these. Um, well, these are fluting irons. These are household fluting irons. Bring a couple of them up here. This is what you'd buy if you had a set of curtains that needed fluting or something. Fluting seemed to be a big thing back then. This piece would be heated on a stove. This would be applied. You'd move your material, do it again, and go right down the, until you're done with the curtain. That's a lot of work to put to put um, as if fancy. they didn't have enough work. Yeah, right. As if they didn't have then enough work. Then go chop work. some wood. Yeah. Then go. <laughs> you got to flute the curtains. Come on, guys. <laughs> and this one here has a little thumb screw in the back allows you to rotate it. You can use it as a fluting iron. Just tighten that back up and do oh, your fluting. Okay. Okay. You had a mating board. You'd probably heat this up and you had a wooden board oh, that okay. you would sure. use to yeah. flute on. And when you're done with that, you can roll it over and go back to using it as a sad iron. Speaking so it was of a dual purpose thing. Speaking of wooden boards, I saw this beautifully chip carved you say it's Scandinavian, you think? Scandinavian on the board, but German influence on the handle. May have been repurposed that somebody okay. else got a hold of it. The engraving on the side, the experts say, was probably done at a later date. It has a date on here of 1731, which is probably the date the board was made because that also appears on top of the board. I think they just copied it. That's really a nifty piece. And it's How was it used? How it's a very it intricate piece if you can get a good look at that. That's very careful. And how was carving. it used? It was used against a round piece. The uh, linen, usually used on table linens, would be folded so it was small enough to fit the board. Uh, this would be longer probably. This is not a real one. Would be wrapped around that, stretched and wrapped around that tightly. And then this piece is called a mangle would be rolled against it okay and that would squeeze out and smooth the linen then it would be like unfolded and dried like your dining table linen right okay right table linen table typically linen. okay right. now i know this is on the other side of the table here we have a piece that comes opens up yeah, these these four items here okay. were supposedly this is pretty standard. Looking. That's a pretty standard sad iron, right? And yeah. that would be put into these compartments okay. and closed up 
and supposedly they fit over the burner of the stove. Okay. You take the lid Which off were the around. burner. Most right, of them were around, right? Yeah. And you'd set that over the burner, get direct heat, which was kind of held against the iron by the upper part of it. This, or this case here would take three irons at a time. And so the iron again, would sit in here and right, sit in here and it would right. be sitting on the stove. And that would be sitting on the stove. Be there. They also made small, uh, well, like a little pot-bellied stove that had positions for as many as eight or 12 irons. Okay. And a commercial tailor would have that sort of thing. Can Not I close this? Would you it, can. It'll mm -hmm. close okay, I just want to put it down and for a minute. If you can, you can see the, the name on there. Beautiful detail this in there. This is made by Enterprise rather than Mrs. Potts. Enterprise. Oh, made the box. Kind of, no. Oh, they, they, they took, took over. over the iron okay. business from the poor woman who <laughs> couldn't protect her patent. Oh. Yeah. This is for a hat? This is for hats. This would be undone, taken out, heated up, All cleaned right. off, set back in here, and that could be done as many times as needed for doing any curved item. Might have been hats, might have been something else. Okay. Anything that needed that egg-shaped curve. And this we piece, have here? this is a French smoothing iron for linen. Hmm. Linen had... But been, it has bumps in it. I don't it know how it bumps works. In it. You got enough bumps in it that as you go across the cloth, you're going to cover everything, but a little at a time. Oh. For some reason on linen, it's called a polishing iron. There's another type that's a small one, about this big. It has a particular shape. Everybody seemed to make the same shape for some reason, but that's called a polishing iron, and it uh, it's used with linen. And this one here is a French one. At this time, they made it heavy enough to do something with, and. Uh, it has a smooth back to it. This is so you don't get wrinkles when you move in the back direction. After you've taken okay. a stroke and you move back, okay. it won't pick up the cloth. That's the idea behind the round back Belgian iron. Same thing. When you back up. As you back up, it won't fold that sure, linen sure. over. That's a nifty one. Um, now that's an old one there. Now. The fluting irons, and I'll take this little one up here first. This is a child's fluting iron, not commonly seen. Most people wouldn't buy that for their child, but that is a child's size. Is that American? Uh, yes, probably American. This is a more typical fluting iron. This is a, this one here would be screwed right to the table, so it was probably commercial. Most of them, were simply clamped to the ironing board. They have a little clamp, a little C-clamp that folds down underneath. Okay. And the way these worked, of course, you've got a curtain or something like that. You don't have a, you may not have an end you can get at. Say it's a round skirt rim or something and you have to get in here. You could push down on this lever and slide in okay. from the side. Spring here closes it up nice and tight. And as you turn the crank, all right. There okay. We for some, oh, we're hitting a slug here. As you turn the crank, it runs that through gives you and your gives flutes. you your flutes. Now, it's an iron, so it should be heated. And that's what we were getting into here. Do they heat the, ro do they heat the roller? You heat the rollers. Both? As you, as you heat this. Okay, you slide a... It comes with a set of little iron, iron slugs. Okay. Also comes with a little set of tongs, like little blacksmith tongs. Typically, they'll build these in an antique store as blacksmith tongs. They're not. Okay. They have a, a long, rounded end, so you can get a hold of these and handle them. You do the same thing. You use the back end of it and the hole in the end of the slug to pull it out. These are heated up in the stove and put into the brass rollers. Heats it up. I wonder how long it stays hot enough to do the flutes. I mean, how long? Well, this process is... Yeah, it, you know, would, it would depend on how much you heated up the slug. Okay. If you heated it red hot, it's going to get hot and stay hot quite a while. Okay. That's really, that's really a nice mechanical piece. What, what is this right here? This was well, this to is, heat iron. This is a heating stove. If, you don't have, if you're somewhere where you don't have a, a cook stove or whatever heat your iron's on, well, this is heat, when you're you camping. You them on this. When you go camping, well, you fill it with what, kerosene? As much iron as they seem to like to do. Okay. Maybe you did take it camping. Yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't be my idea. But your iron sat on top of that. 
In this case, you've got three separate burners with little isinglass windows so you can adjust the flame. And if we can get this open one-handed, you can see... They're wicks like, a, like very, a lamp. Very wide wicks. So you've got quite a bit of flame going on in there. If they're adjusted right, they won't produce soot. And you have adjusters for each one. And a little fill cap in the back. That would be filled with kerosene. Now, Jim, um, sometimes people in the audience want to get involved in collecting like this, and it's a detailed uh, process. Is there a book that uh, someone can look at and go yeah. to identify something they found, for instance? Absolutely. There's a very good book. Unfortunately, it's out of print. But this book here, <clears throat> Pressing Irons and Trivets, Esther Burney. Okay. Okay. This is a great general book for somebody that's getting started. Got it. Yeah, very good. There are other books that have a lot of material in them, but for a, a one book, if you could only have one book, this would be it. And I, I think uh, while they're not in print right now, you do a book search, you should be able to find one. One of the questions I ask a lot of collectors, Jim, is, okay, someday you're going to be tired of this collection or want it to go some, to a good home. You're right, how, well, exactly. How, how will you do that, do you think? Well, I'll do that by copping out and dying. Oh, <laughs> let <laughs> somebody else daughter, handle it? Yeah. My daughter. Get, I'll give you my card. I'll handle this for you. Get rid of this. And okay. uh, one thing we have here, this is a, a collector's club for irons. And when I go once a year to their okay. big meeting, they'll generally have an auction. And their auctions include all sorts of very nice irons that okay. are from other collections, of course. We'll shoot a close-up so we'll shoot a close up of this and put it on the show. That would be great. Jim, yeah. we're running out of time. Okay. Uh, and so um, I want to thank you and your uh, lovely wife for letting us see this collection and hear all about wrinkle removers, because that's basically Absolutely. what they are. We really <laughs> appreciate it. Thank it's you. been good. All right, so Jim was nice enough to show us his collection, and I love to hear about collections. So if you have a collection you want to talk about, or you know someone who has a collection that you think they might want to talk about, contact me, Kent Lund, at bctvthecollectors at gmail.com. Thanks. Mm -hmm.